Uh, speaking of which, if, so if you, don't, if you don't know me, my name is Bailey Alexander, and I am the director of Redemptive Arts. In about two years, I'll be the pastor of Redemptive Arts because I'm in school to finally get that title. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I care about. So I just, I'm looking to, looking to buy new business cards. That's what I'd like to do. Get, get the upgrade there. But, um, yeah, I've been here for six and a half years in this role, and essentially my role Anything that has to do with uh, the church artistically, um, I, I'm in charge of. I'm not great at, but I find people who are great at uh, those things and help empower them to do that as part of their ministry. So whether it be through photography, videography, skits, painting, uh, or you know, on stage. And those people back there, they know they run me. I, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm thankful that you do it. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, so that's my job. I love my job. I love pastoring these people. Um, and, and learning from them as well. Um, but my family is, um, Sarah is my beautiful wife, and she and I have been married for a little over, well, 11 and a half years now. And Camden, blonde hair, blue eyes, five years old. And Kenley, the sassy, I, I didn't even think about it when I got it, but that's Kenley. Like, just, you know, like, you know Kenley, because you're like, oh, I, hi, Kenley. She'll be like, mm-mm. To this morning, right? They're like, oh, Kenley. She's like, don't think so. No. Yeah, that is our sassy two-year-old Kenley. We love her to death and all of her sassiness. But our family loves this place. This is our, this is our family. Um, we've had opportunities to go other places, but this is where I grow from my pastor. This is where my wife and I grow together. And um, just as importantly, this is where our kids grow. And I'm thankful, I say it often, but I'm thankful for what happens down that hallway. If you have children, know that your kids aren't just being watched. I mean, they are being invested in. And uh, I, I'm so thankful for, for this family. So last week, Brad kicked off a, a mini-series, as he called it. Um, and he said, <laughs> he said uh, this week I'm going to preach on Noah. Next week, Bailey's going to preach. And then, and then we'll have one more week. Um, if you know Brad well, or if you were here September through March, might be three weeks, could be six months. We'll see. We are going to see how this goes. Uh, but whatever it is, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm, I, was, I was very thankful for Brad's message last week on Noah, and, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to, to share it this week. But um, everyone loves a good story. You know, unlikely heroes, we think of stories. Um, maybe, maybe for you, when you think unlikely hero, you think of... Uh, maybe you think of, you know, a book that you've read. Maybe you think of a movie. Maybe for you, uh, like me, it's, it's a sports, you know, a sports story. So when Brad called me and said, hey, I would love for you to preach. I'm going to be um, doing a ministry thing this weekend, this upcoming weekend. I'd love for you to preach. So I said, yes, sir. And um, he said, well, it's going to be called Unlikely Heroes. So maybe Think of an, an unlikely hero that, you know, like a present-day unlikely hero you can help connect with. And, like, in two seconds, I was like, Mike Miller. And he was like, don't know who you're talking about, but good luck. And I can tell 99% of you are don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, if you know me well or if you so, follow me on social media, you know I, I am a huge sports fan. Um, and I have two major loves when it comes to sports. And it is the, the Buckeyes in general um, and LeBron James. Yes. Yes. Someone said Cavs. LeBron James. Um, so in, so we're, we're, I want to take too much of your time. So in 2012, LeBron's with the Miami Heat, and they make it to the finals. Um, they're coming off back-to-back seven-game series against the Pacers and the Celtics, and they're going to go against the young, fast, athletic, up-and-coming Oklahoma City Thunder, who have Kevin Durant, who just won a second championship, James Harden, who's probably going to win the MVP, even though we know he shouldn't, and uh, Russell Westbrook, who is also um, an, an MVP, and I, I, my dad's here and is a big Thunder fan. It's funny, I didn't think about that until just now. Um, but so, so going into the series, Mike Miller w was picked up by the by the Heat in the offseason. He's a sharpshooter. He's a three-point specialist. That's, that's what he does. When you think Mike Miller, you think of just three-point shooting. And so going into, going into the finals, Mike Miller was banged up. The guy could not find the floor very much because he was always, like, his, he was having back problems. And so if he has to play any sort of defense, you get banged up even more and just couldn't find the floor very much. Um, so games one through four, it was a five-game series, through games one through four, Mike was only able to find the floor for 20 minutes 
and got two of five shots up. So he made two of five shots for six points or five points. Um, but going into game five, the Heat are up three to one, um, kind of surprising most people as their, of their predictions. And Coach Spolster said, like, I've got to find ways to, fi to get some of these other role players in um, because I need to get my, my top three guys, you know, some rest in game four. LeBron had cramps. Um, I'm telling you more than you need to know because that's how my mind works. Sorry. So, yeah, come on. So, uh, so in game five, Mike Miller finds the floor. And post-game, Spolstra said, co the coach of the Heat, he said, I had only planned on playing him three minutes just to give, give someone a blow. But he came out on fire. The guy ends up going six of seven from three, scoring 23 points in 23 minutes. And to me, that was like unlikely hero. He helped make my favorite player a champion. So I, I, that's the first person that came to my mind. Now I will, I will play to the audience a little more. Cardale Jones. Yeah, so our, our Buckeye favorite quarterback from 2014, except for Corey Knox. Uh, uh, so in short, so, so start of the 2014 year, the, the Buckeyes third string quarterback, Braxton Miller goes down and, and up comes this, uh, someone that unless you follow recruiting, don't know, a redshirt freshman, JT Barrett. JT Barrett takes them all through the season, loses to the vaulted uh, Hokies over there. <laughs> and uh, we, oh, if you, we heard about that for a long time. This dude brought his helmet in the day after they lost to Virginia Tech. Like, it was a nightmare of a Sunday for us. But Jesus be lifted high instead. Um, but so, so, um, so JT takes them all the way through the rest of the season. They, they rattle off 10 games. And I got to watch the Michigan State game in, um, in Mexico with my wife. That was pretty cool. Um, but going into the last game of the, of, the, of the year, going into the rivalry game and um, playing very well against that team up north. In the first play of the fourth quarter, uh, one thing that was JT was always really good at was the um, was the zone read. He always like 88 percent, 91 percent, always made the right read. Well, sure enough, first play of the fourth quarter, he makes the wrong read, gets tackled um, by multiple people in the backfield, and breaks his ankle. So in comes Cardale Jones. Um, if you. Never mind. So, so Cardale comes in, and he helps, he helps bring them all the way to a national championship. They beat, you know, the number six team in the nation by 59 to nothing. They beat the number one team in the nation. They beat the number two team in the nation, even though four horrible turnovers. Uh, and so who would have ever thought at the beginning of the season, no one would have said, like, your third street quarterback is going to take you all the way to a national championship. So um, that was just me playing to the crowd and enjoying some look back of 2014 Buckeyes led by Cardale Jones. <laughs> Cardale. But what, what, but what we don't know, what we didn't see is, was all the hours that both these, both these men put into honing their craft, right? Mike didn't leave the gym every single shoot around until he put in 103 pointers. And, and Cardale was, they said he was so good at watching JT and always learning, always being, um, always being, you know, a, a, a coach of the game. Like he wanted to be all in all the time. And their coaches knew that when their number was called, they would be ready. And so today, as we look at the life, life of Joseph um, and how his, we're going to see how his life parallels to Jesus. One of the, well, the most unlikely hero of all time, really. And I say Jesus was an unlikely hero uh, because think, you know, one thing that I've learned as I've, as I've been under Brad is that he's, he's made the Bible come to life for me because he says, put yourself in the narrative, right? So these people who are growing up with Jesus, literally with him, um, they just see a little boy. He's a, he's a boy of a carpenter. Um, you know, he starts hanging out in synagogues and seems kind of like he knows what he's doing. But they, I mean, he really came from nothing. Um, and then he eventually, you know, he eventually saves the whole world, all of humanity for all time, right? And so we know that God, his father, his coach, if you will, um, he knew the greatness inside of his son. And he knew the assignment that his son would need to accomplish. And so I think... I think hearing stories of and reading and, and learning the stories of, of Noah, of Joseph, um, I think, again, our pastor, I think tomorrow or next week is Abraham. We'll see. Uh, I think so. Either way, still applies. Learning these stories and knowing them, these guys weren't, they weren't some, none of them were princes or kings or anything like that. They 
were ordinary people who God used, and through their obedience, he was able to use them to accomplish great things. Um, so let's dive into the story of Joseph. I'm going to try not to talk too fast. That's one thing I do too often, so I apologize um, if I do. But Joseph's story is kind of goes through Genesis 37 through uh, 50. And I would encourage you, we obviously aren't going to cover all that today, but I would encourage you to um, to read the story of Joseph. Learn about it for yourself. Learn of all the little intricacies in the, in the narrative that we can't go into today um, and learn about this amazing man of God. So a little backstory of Joseph. Um, and essentially what we're going to do today, I'm just going to tell you the story of Joseph and, and give you my unwarranted commentary um, and, and uh, some, some things that maybe, maybe we can learn from his story. So Jacob, jo- uh, sorry, J- Joseph had a lot of things going on uh, for him early on in life. And he was, he was a good looking guy, young guy. He was the firstborn son of, of Jacob through Rachel. And therefore, and I encourage you to go back and read about, about Jacob and Rachel and, and hearing about the, the lineage of Jesus through that. But it was, um, it was because of that that Joseph was the, the favorite uh, in the family. And everyone knew it, um, not only because of the, the lineage stuff there, but also because um, of the coat he wore. If you, if you know the story or even the musical that is loosely based on the Bible, uh, <laughs> I think the coat might have been the only thing based on the Bible. But either way, great looking coat um, in that movie if you've seen it. So... Uh, but we knew he had to have been a favorite because a coat like that would have cost a ton of money. In that day, any sort of dyed fabric was, was very expensive. And so, so you, have this, you have this kid, you know, walking around in this magnificent coat. So his brothers, his, his, Joseph's brothers hate him for that. They hate him because he is the favorite, um, obviously, from his father. They also hate him because he's an unfiltered fellow who is a dreamer. And tells his older brothers about these dreams that he has. He's like, listen to this, guys. I had this dream. You're going to love this. You guys bowed down to me. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) No. Uh, They they essentially, um, they took, you know, so the favoritism compounded with these uh, dreams that that made made Joseph in their eyes look really haughty. they, it, it, it spurned them on to hate him so much that they, they took him, they threw him in a hole, and uh, their plan is to kill him. So in my mind, as they're, as they're kind of preparing to, to kill Joseph, figure out how they're going to do this, these slave traders come by, and they think, well, one, at least we can get some cash out of this deal. Um, and number two, uh, we get him out of here, and our inheritance now increases because uh, there's less of us. So, so that's what they end up doing, and they take, they, they take Joseph's coat from him, um, and they, they rip it up, they bloody it up, they take it back to their father as evidence to show, uh, hey, uh, Joseph, Joseph died. Um, but can you imagine, like, can, put yourself in the narrative. So this, this kid of 17 years old is, is being taken into slavery. How incredibly frightening that would have to be. Um, yet what we're going to see throughout this story is through Joseph's hardships, God had his hand on Joseph the whole time, through every step, and obedience is going to be key through this. So, so moving on uh, throughout the narrative, Joseph, he, so because he's built well, I imagine he's a pretty buff guy, just that's the way Disney portrayed him. I, I don't know if it was Disney, but some, probably not Disney, it was some, they did like, look it up, it's, I think it might be on, it's on Right Now Media, there's your Right Now Media plug for the day. If you don't know what Right Now Media is, go to lifepoint.cc and find out more. Um, and I will connect you to right now media. But, um, so yeah, so he's a good-looking guy. He's built well. And, and Potiphar, who is kind of second in command under Pharaoh, he sees him. He, he takes him into his household. Now, this is, to me, was key right away that God's hand is still on Joseph because he could have been bought by someone working out in the fields and put into harm's way through heat or through wild animals. Um, he could have been bought by someone who, was built, who helped build temples and put in harm's way that way. But instead, he's taken into the second in command of, of Egypt, and, um, and he is kind of the overseer uh, of the family um, from the slave side. So um, Joseph, he's doing a good job. He's overseeing the family. He's doing a great job. He's, getting, he's gaining uh, great trust and great recognition, recognition by the family. Um, including Potiphar's wife. So 
Potiphar's wife sees him, probably sees a young looking guy, and she tries to get him to go to bed with her. And, and she's asking, she's like, come, come to bed with me. And he's, he's saying no. And so we see Joseph's moral compass is, is, is aligned with God right from, right from the get-go because he didn't have to. He didn't have to say no. I mean, this is his boss's wife. He's in slavery. He knows if he says no, she could just go back. He, he could be killed um, and whatnot. And so sure enough, that's essentially what happens as Joseph eventually gets cornered by um, she, he gets cornered by Potiphar's wife, um, and as he runs, she tears a piece of his, of his coat. And poor guy can't keep a nice piece of clothing to save his life either. I, I, I would hate to be Joseph's mother. I mean, she's, uh, she, he, she'd be like, this is his whole life. Um, but um, so she then, like his brothers, uh, she takes that piece of, piece of clothing. She takes it to her husband. And she says, see, this is evidence. Uh, he attacks me. Um, and so, so Joseph, despite, this is the hardship, right? Despite making all the right decisions, despite saying yes to the things of God and no to sin, he gets thrown into prison. And that would be so, I, I don't know, like, uh, yes, last night I'm sitting in this place, I'm going through this, and my mind's just, as I'm putting myself in the narrative, I don't know how I would have reacted. I would have been so angry, like, God, I'm doing I'm doing all the right things. I'm saying yes to all the right things, and yet why do I keep finding myself here? I imagine, like, if you've seen what about, oh, man, I'm a mess. If you've seen what about Bob, it's like, I'm doing the work. I'm baby steps, right? Look it up. 1997, something like that. It's a great movie. Um, but, but, yeah, so, so I imagine he's like that. Like, Joseph is in that mode of, like, of questioning. But we don't, we don't read that. And I don't think questioning God is, is, is a sin, um, but he instead, but he stays in obedience, and God's hand is on him the entire time. So remember this. But I do, rem- do remember this. As we continue to read through Joseph's life, our obedience gives God the opportunity to set the stage for something bigger. And I think if you were given a card on your way in, it's on the back of your card. Our obedience gives God the opportunity to set the stage for something much bigger. You see, because of the free will that we are given we have the opportunity to say no. We have the opportunity to oppose God. Um, and, and we can disregard God's commands, which results in not giving him the opportunity to work his purpose through our lives. And so it's kind of like, in, in my mind, it's like, okay, you're not going to obey me. That's your decision. I, I'm going to go on to someone who will, that sort of thing. Um, so Potiphar's wife, I'm um, sorry, that was, that was back when. So now Joseph is in jail. Um, so we see Joseph is in jail. He's in, in jail for quite a long time. And, and then we read that he, as I, as I alluded to before communion, he is in jail with two other men. And it was just baffling to me. I can't, I can't explain, like, the joy. I'm sitting in Mission Coffee downtown, and I'm reading, just reading the life of Joseph again. And I've read it so many times, and for the first time it hit me that how cool that God would would allow these same elements of wine and bread that he, use, that he uses um, in, the, in the upper room through Jesus and, and to the disciples. Uh, it, was just, it, was just a really, it was just a really cool moment for me. Um, and and I, again, I, was, I thought right back to Jesus. And I mean, it's the same thing, right? When we see the cross, when you, have been, when you realize that you've been bought with a price that, and what that price was that God did for you, what God gave for you, he gave his only son, when I see that cross, all I can think about is grace. All I can think about is forgiveness. All I can think about is conquering sin and death. And so look for those, look for those things yourself. As you're reading the Old Testament, as you're reading the New Testament, look for different elements that help remind you of who Jesus is, help remind you or ties back to a story of the Old Testament or ties back to a story or Jesus in the New Testament. Um, I think it's, it was just it was a great awakening in my mind um, from from that morning. It was just amazing. And great coffee. Um, if you know me. So Joseph hears the, these guys tell him their dreams. Um, he must just had a face that people wanted to talk to is, is the only thing I can guess. And so, uh, so the, 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 the baker says, hey, I had this crazy dream about bread. And this cupbearer says, I had this crazy dream about wine. What does it mean? And so Joseph threw through Jesus or through God's um, 
gifting abilities says, I'm sorry, um, your dream means in three days you're going to be killed. That's a rough interpretation to say to somebody. Uh, and to you, sir, uh, in three days you are going to be lifted back into your position. And when you are, when you're lifted back in that position, remember me, he says. Um, sure enough, he didn't. Uh, the cupbearer did not remember Joseph. And two years, so Joseph is now in prison for two more years. Um, and in this time, uh, after, you know, when that two years is up, I, again, I can only imagine Joseph's mindset, like, what am I doing? Why Why am I here? Um, but we, that's kind of our own, we're kind of like our own narrative in that section. We don't know. But he stays safe for two years, but in, in that, at the end of that two-year period, Pharaoh's now having these crazy dreams. His guys, uh, magisterial magicians or whatever they were, they couldn't figure it out. Um, and in that conversation, over here in the conversation, the cupbearer says, hey, if this guy is still alive, I forgot about him, uh, I know the guy who can get you, who can help you. So, um, so remember, that bottom line, our obedience gives God an opportunity to set the stage for something much bigger. Because of Joseph's obedience, now he has an opportunity to talk to the, to the top dog, right? He is now going to talk to Pharaoh, the, the guy who's in charge of the entire land, um, the most powerful man um, in the land. So Pharaoh sends for Joseph, and he tells him, he's like, hey, I got these crazy dreams, seven skinny cows eating seven healthy cows, and then this other one where these like, seven healthy grains of, heads of grain, ate these seven wilted, you know, heads of grain. Uh, he's like, so, bad pizza? What do you say? And Joseph, so the, I love this part, because this, this again shows us the character of Joseph. Uh, this is really cool. So Joseph responds to Pharaoh when Pharaoh asks him if he can interpret them. He says, I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So in that moment, a moment where he could have bolstered himself, a moment where he could have let the spotlight been all on him, he again sheds light to the giver of the gift, right? Again, remaining in obedience to God, which I love. Man, I love that. Um, so after hearing Pharaoh's dreams, Joseph through the power of God, tells him that, so here's what it means. So you're going to have seven years of abundance, uh, and everything's going to be amazing, but those seven years are going to be followed by seven years of famine. And so Joseph tells him, hey, here's, here's a plan of how you can be prepared for those seven years of famine. And Pharaoh is super impressed, and he says, hey, here are the keys to the kingdom. And he puts him essentially in charge of the whole thing, the whole operation. Um, and so Joseph is lifted up and I think, see, that's why that's why I think it's important for us. Like, I, I've had many people say, you know, what what good can I do in ministry because I don't work in a church and all and things like that. I'm like, oh my word. Sometimes I feel like I had a greater impact on my community when in the five years I worked at Starbucks because I was interacting with non Christians constantly. My role has changed is changed more now where I'm interacting and trying to help disciple and lift up Christians and build them up, um, but also still trying to find ways to connect with non-Christians. So this is why I think it's important. We need businessmen. We need Starbucks employees. We need everyone to be on mission, uh, to know who they are in Christ, and to be able to infiltrate, if you will, their workplaces, um, because as you... Because as you stay in, in obedience to God and you have favor where you're at, man, God can use you and it will set the stage for something much bigger. I didn't say that in first service. That was special. Um, it wasn't in my notes, which, as you can see, I'm very glued to. So, oh, man, I love this. So, after, the, so the seven years go by, the seven years of plenty, and they do their job well, and they are well prepared um, and, and we read that people are coming to Egypt asking for food. And sure enough, two years into the seven years of famine, Joseph's, br Joseph's brothers walk through the door. Now, I don't know about you. My first inclination would be, I hate them for what they did to me. I'm going to find a way to get back at them. I have the power to kill them. Those are the first things. I mean, how much anger and anguish and bitterness could have been inside Joseph. 
but instead, and this is important because when we, when you are aligned with God and for us now, as we are Christians, as we are, as we are supposed to be like Christ, um, when, we, when we come into a relationship with him, we take on the characteristics of Christ. That's what we should do. Now, I say that, I want you to know, I struggle daily to look like Christ. And it is, it is a daily commitment to make the next right step, right? And yesterday, my wife had through, <laughs> my wife is, is, a, is a great one to help get me back in line. And she's like, you, your attitude today, not my favorite. Uh, and, and it just wasn't. And I was like, noted, lady. Uh, I had a bad attitude a lot yesterday. <laughs> and, um, but, but, but truly, but God has put this reverse gear in my, in my, in my heart to where I'm, you know, go back and apologize, and, and, and I try to reverse those things quick. So we take on the characteristics of God, right? And those things that I label bitterness, anger, you know, the want to, to retaliate, those things, those are not part of God's character. And so we don't see that out of Joseph. Instead, what we see from Joseph is that he says, here, here's food. He, I think he snuck the money back to them. So he doesn't even make them pay for the food. And he sends them on their way, on their way. And he says one thing. He says, but when, if you return, if you need more food, you have to pr- prove yourself trustworthy by bringing your brother Benjamin back to me. And so, uh, sure enough, food runs out, and they return back to Egypt, and they know they have to bring their, their brother Benjamin. And so, when Joseph sees Benjamin with them, uh, Joseph invites them to have lunch with them. And I think... I think he's awestruck to see Benjamin because uh, I, th- I think he figured Benjamin suffered the same fate he should have. That's my guess, because uh, he wasn't with them. All of them were there, but, but Benjamin. And so he's, he's kind, of, kind of floored. So he sets in motion, um, he sets in, mo- sets in motion a plan. So while they're eating, he sneaks his silver cup, I think through a servant, sneaks his silver cup into Benjamin's bag and sends them on his way. Then he sends his troops after them and says, hey, they stole my silver cup. You find who it is, you bring them back, that person's dead. Um, and, and so they go, the troops go after them, they find them, they go through the bags, and sure enough, they find the silver cup in Benjamin's bag, and so they bring them back. And I imagine the brothers are floored. They're like, we did not, I promise, and all these things, right? But they kind of have no choice. And so... Um, it's interesting when they do return in, in Genesis 44, 17, Joseph's narrative changes a little bit. What he says here, he says, so then he says, only the one who is found to have the cup will be my slave. And so now he's going to rescue Benjamin. Um, and uh, the rest of you can go back to your father in peace. So Joseph, in his mind, he's actually showing great grace. And he's giving the brothers what they want, again, in his mind, right? And I th- I think because he thinks Benjamin was the favorite, and the reason he thinks that is because the first time that they came to Egypt, Benjamin wasn't with them. And so, okay, Benjamin must be the favorite, so one, he thought he was dead. Now he thinks, okay, so he must have been the favorite, so I don't want him to suffer the same fate I had. So he is now my slave. You guys go. You get what you want. I get what I want. I help save um, my brother, right? However, that's not... Uh, so instead of just going on their way, I think he thinks that they're just going to go on their way and go back home. Instead, um, instead, this amazing transformation is shown when Judah, one of the brothers, tells Joseph that not returning with Benjamin will absolutely kill their father. Now Joseph sees and he realizes that this conversion has happened in his brothers. Um, and the ones, the ones that hated him so deeply have now changed. And, and they are not the same way they were. So at that point, Joseph then knows he has to reveal himself. And so he reveals himself to his brothers. And he says, hey, this is who I am. So think, uh, and think, like he's 30 years old. They probably, they probably didn't recognize him. 30, I'm doing math. Uh, but he's around 30 years old at this point. And they didn't recognize him. They had to have been floored. And they also had to have been scared because this is the guy in charge. And even Judah himself speaking up, uh, he could have been put to death just for speaking out like that, right? Uh, but again, Joseph is showing great grace in, in the place that he's in. And he says, he tells them, not only do I not hate you, I want you to know, um, and I think it's Genesis 45, 4 through 4, I want you to know what you intended for evil, what you intended for harm, God used for good. 
And I think that's, that spoke to me in, 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 because often when we get into hard places, our immediate reaction, or at least mine, is what did I do wrong? Why am I being punished, right? But maybe, just, just maybe, those are growing areas. Those are times where God's like, I'm going to put you through it because on the other end, through your obedience, I'm going to set you up to, I'm going to set you up to use you in a really, really great and powerful way. Um, another cool thing I get from the story of Joseph. So Joseph comes from the, Isra- comes from the Israelites, and, and he, is an, he is an Israelite himself who are God's holy, special people, right? What if, I just let my mind go down this road last night. I'm like, what if Joseph wouldn't have remained obedient? What happens to God's people? Because now, now they starve to death. I, I have no idea. It's just cool to see the way that, our, that Joseph's obedience kept what God intended, kept it all happening. Um, and it's kind of just one of those what if moments. I'm sure God would have used someone else to help save his, his holy people. But it's just one of those what if moments. And so for me, I was like, man, I want to I continue. As Brad says, make the next right step. It just, it just made me kind of lean into that moment and say, who knows what's on the line? Who's others, who other, like their spiritual lives are on the line because of the choices I make. So I want to remain in obedience to set God up to use me to fulfill his great purposes. So my coffee is free. The story of Joseph, like Jesus, is a story of grace. Right? Grace is, uh, grace is getting the good that we don't deserve. Uh, and Brad also says, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Because of what Christ did, we now have grace. We now have the opportunity through forgiveness um, to have eternal life with him. And like Joseph, these are the parallels that I thought was just so cool. And to be honest, I didn't say this first service. To be honest, I stole this from my children's children's Bible. So, sorry. Um, you should read, I forget what the name of that Bible is, but it's amazing. Every single story ties back to Jesus in some way. It is beautiful, and I love teaching my kids this. But I learned this from this in, uh, in studying the adult Bible, too. But um, <laughs> like Joseph, Jesus was hated by his brothers. Like Joseph, Jesus was sold for pieces of silver. Like Joseph, he was tempted in the desert, yet... Um, Yet he stayed true to what God commanded him and what he was asking of him. He obeyed his commands. And like Joseph, Jesus was falsely accused. He was punished for things he didn't do. And very much like Joseph, Jesus um, chose to forgive his enemies and showed grace and mercy to them. See, I think personally, I forget often that Jesus was all God and all, and all man, and he had choices himself. He had the choice to choose right from wrong, right? And, but every single time he chose to obey his father, he chose to obey his father because he knew that God had a great and mighty thing lined up for him um, in his life. So, so as we think of what makes up an unlikely hero, remember that God has a beautiful method for using ordinary people to fulfill his extraordinary assignments, he can use every single one of us, and he wants to. We are his hands and feet here on earth. We are, we are compelled through Matthew 29, 18, where we're, we're told, like, go make disciples. I need you to go share this story of grace, this share this story of mercy and what I did so that all have the opportunity to come to know me. That's you and me. Like, that, we are the same we're the same unlikely heroes, just like Joseph. We have the opportunity when we obey God's commands. And so these assignments that God sets us up for, they always point back to fulfilling God's purpose for all to come into a relationship with him. Um, so this week, as you meet in your groups, uh, if you're in the life group, and I'll come back to that, but, uh, or as you think about this individually, think about these three things. Number one, um, Joseph chose to be forgiving. We had every right to be unforgiving. And how often have I found myself in that place where someone wronged me? I have the right 
to do whatever I want, right? I have the right to, to hate them. I have the right to un, or to not forgive them. But that's, again, not part of God's characteristics. And if I'm going to call myself a Christian, if I'm going to be Christ-like, then I better look like Christ. And so the question for, for you and for me, is there, any, is there someone in your life that you need to forgive today? Is there someone who has wronged you that you have the right to not for, to forgive them? But because of the grace and because of the forgiveness God has offered us, we are called to do the same. Like Joseph, are you willing to trade in your right for freedom? Because when, when you choose to forgive, you are free from the bondage of that, of that situation, of that person, all those things. You're set free from them. And also, it helps mend a relationship, can help mend a relationship, right? Um, and really, that's what, that's what the church is all about. It's about relationships. Um, number two, grace is a gift that when we give it, it helps us grow. Is there anyone today that, that could use some, that needs to grow in the giving of grace? I know I do. I stood here last night saying, I am, I'm, I am so quick to judge. I am so, um, it takes me a long time to show grace to someone when I've been wronged or whatever the situation may be. So last night I'm here, I'm just like, God, help me to be a grace giver just like you were. Help me to show the same grace and love and mercy that you show, show me daily to others because that's what we are called to be and called to do. And number three, unlikely heroes obey God and they give him the opportunity to set the stage for something bigger. God wants to use you to fulfill his plans and purposes, to fulfill these extraordinary assignments. These, these things are not just for Joseph. They're not just for Jesus. They're for you and me, and when we act in obedience and we remain obedient to what God has called us to, we give him the opportunity to use us. Amen? Amen. I, so lastly, I want to say, if you are not connected, if this is your church home and you are not connected to a life group, I highly encourage you to figure um, or to go find. Corey is over here. He was on stage. I'm here. I'm willing to answer questions. And then as the video said, we have some people with red lanyards on. I highly encourage you to go find them. You don't have to know any answers. We, we will figure out the answers. But if you, want to, um, if you want to do that, you can do that. You can also, if you're just not a people person, uh, you can go to the LifePoint Church app and you can search groups there as well. But today is a great opportunity to do that. And the reason why is because the people in my men's group, the people in my mixed group, my, my life groups, those are the first people I go to. As I struggle with this, if I'm sitting out there, I'm like, I am not good at forgiving, but I do feel like I have a right to not forgive, and grace is something I don't understand. Those are the first people I'm going to. Those are the people that are going to help walk me through what it means. Those are the people that are going to help, help me uh, figure these things out, and they're also the people that are going to hold me accountable when I say, I have, I need, there's, there's a couple people I need to forgive. They're the people who are going to hold me accountable. So I do encourage you, if you want to stay connected to this church, get connected to a life group. Um, that's super important.